budget for the upcoming school year and to present that budget it's uh i'm pleased to introduce victoria galante who is our assistant superintendent for business and she's going to share her screen with you to make the presentation okay thank you dr israel good morning everyone so nice to see everyone even if if it's over zoom um okay can everyone see my screen yeah. Yep. yep. Okay. So this is what was presented um, at our budget hearing on May 5th. Um, we are required by law to have a budget hearing. So we are, I will go through the slides. I think Dr. Yana just jumped on and she'll have uh, talked to some of the slides um, during the presentation also. All right, let's start. Okay. So the Board of Education adopted the 2021-2022 budget on April 14th, 2021. Um, the tax levy limit that was calculated for the district uh, will be 1.66. Um, you could see from the top of the slide what that is in dollars. It's a little over $72 million. The levy for this year that we're in now was uh, almost $71 million. This is just a slide that I like to show showing the um, levy throughout the years. Um, below the, the blank line is the levies before the tax cap calculation law was put into effect. And these are the levies since then. So as you notice, the year we're in now, the 2021 school year, we levied 2%. So for next year, the 21-22 school year, we are levying, levying less, but it will be 1.66%. So a little history of what happened this school year. So last year, around this time, uh, we were being told, we were right in the, the midst of COVID, we were being told by the state that they were gonna give us a 20% cut in our state aid. We we're going to have mid-year cuts. And it was really a very doom and gloom picture for the district and for everyone involved because of COVID. So what happened, we took out almost 2 million, a little over $2 million in this year's budget. We reduced the budget by 10% and we reduced some lines that we could just to be, not feel the 20% so hard during the year because we figured, all right, let's be conservative and take some money out to begin with. So that's what we did. But we realized by December, a lot of our budget lines were short because we had to buy so many items related to COVID. We needed to hire more teachers. We needed to hire more TAs and, and monitors. There was the big need for the... Um, Chromebooks and hotspots, not only you know in our uh, custodial area, we needed to buy special equipment to sanitize things. We needed to fix the air filtration systems. So we needed, what we did in December was take a million seven from our unassigned, fu unassigned fund balance, which we're allowed to keep. It's about 4% of the budget on the side um, for emergency use. So this was definitely an emergency use. So in actuality, what we really needed to function in this year was more like $94 million and not the $92 million budget that you know, was passed. Um, so when you look at it, you look at it that way, the 2021-22 the budget where we're asking for 95 million really isn't that much higher than what this year's budget should have been. So just, just, to, just to give you a, a picture of what we had to do here at the school district. We will have to pay back this 1 million seven and put it back into our unassigned fund balance once we close our books at the end of this year and we figure out how much um, maybe funds would be left. So this is the, uh, the budget for next year. It is presented to you in three components. Um, the administrative component is the first, and I'm not going to go line by line um, with it. I'll just point out a few lines that have, you know, uh, big increases or de decreases in them. 
like the Office of Finance and Business, which would be everyone in my office, myself, everything we need to function in the business office. Uh, we had a retirement and we thought, because again, because of COVID, we didn't want to hire anyone that we could take that position and split it up between people. But that didn't seem to work out too well because it is a very intense position. Um, so we put that back in the budget, plus whatever other contractual obligations we need to pay moving forward next year. <clears throat> Office of Personnel, once again, we were overwhelmed with COVID and tra tracing and testing and quarantining things. We finally did hire someone in HR in our personnel office to help central office out and all that. So that person plus other contractual obligations are in this line, account for that increase. Um, on this slide, again, there are some increases, not, nothing major. Nothing really to speak of, just usually contractual, you know, our insurance premiums go up like, like your premiums go up for your car and your homeowner's insurance. We've, we're faced with the same thing at the school. Um, office of curriculum, that increase again has to do with um, salary obligations, contractual obligations, professional development for all our coordinators. We do have all co coordinators in place. Uh, again, because of COVID, we, COVID, we really needed people to oversee different areas um, of instruction. So we have that. And the supervision of school, again, once again, is your principals, your uh, APs, all your building needs, your clerical in the building, and all, all everything they need to run uh, buildings. And that what what's accounts for the $180,000 increase. So for next year, your admin um, component is uh, $7,754,290. The next component is your capital. And that has to do with running the facilities of the school. Operation of plant, again, increases in what is needed um, for cleaning, maintaining, um, the structure, salaries, and things like that, and uh, maintenance of plant is also associated with that. Refund of the real properties as a city school district. We need to pay back out tax certs when they come come up. But this million five doesn't affect the budget because we have a reserve that offsets that. So on my revenue side, I have a million five to pay for any of the tax certs that we have to pay for in October of 2021. Um, we have a spreadsheet, we are in contact with the city as far as all that goes. Um, and when we get an order and judgment that says we have to pay, we have to pay. Uh, bond interest, that's what's going down because they're gonna actually one of the uh, bond principles is gonna fall off the books uh, next year in 2023, I believe. So that's the interest is going down and the principal payment is going up. So that accounts for that. Transfer to capital is the money that we've been using to do small projects in the district over the past four or five years since we started to do this transfer to capital. It's like capital outlay. And the next slide will show what we're going to use that $850,000 on. So for that $850,000, we're gonna to try to do a few things. Just so you know, there's not one ADA compliant restroom in the district, not one. So we really need to start addressing that. We do have students in wheelchairs. We still have students that have you know, disabilities uh, that need that ADA compliant restrooms. And at this point, we don't have it. So we're gonna to address that in the middle school and the high school, one each in restroom in each of those schools. And also I'll just stick with the restrooms in the Connolly school. We're going to address a, a two ADA compliant um, restrooms there. Then in the high school was going to go back and address the library HVAC system that has not worked for years. The units there cannot not even be uh, repaired. You know, they don't even use units like that anymore. And hopefully we can get to the flooring and the library and um, finish, finish that area off. So that's what we're going to do with the $850,000. Uh, the next component and the biggest component in our budget is our program component. And that all has to do with a teacher, teaching schools, special ed teachers, and things like that. So the first line, teaching regular school, has gone up, yes, because a lot of um, 
we had to hire new teachers, new, new, a lot of uh, TAs, teacher assistants, a lot of monitors, uh, plus other contractual obligations that went along with all that that was needed because of the hybrid teaching and, and things like that. Special ed, you know, you may say, well, why did special ed go down? We definitely did not lose any special ed students. If anything, we have more special ed students than before. But a lot of our retired teachers from last year uh, were special ed teachers. So when we hired new teachers, naturally they came in on a lower pay scale. So that, that, that helped with the savings in that line. O occupational ed, we have a lot more students going half day to uh, school here and half day to the BOCES program for uh, electrical, um, cos cosmetology, uh, carpentry, things like that. Um, so they're taking advantage of those courses. Um, and basically the next two lines are really not much of a dollar change. Uh, computer assisted instruction, we did hire two more people in that area. Um, as you can imagine, our IT department during COVID was just overwhelmed um, trying to get devices out. And I do have to say, we gave devices out to every one of our students in the district, no matter where they were, who they were, homeless that, that wound up living in Brooklyn. We got them their devices, hotspots if they didn't have connectivity. We did everything we could so every child had that opportunity to learn during COVID. Um, Victoria, I'm gonna uh, just interrupt you. Could you clarify for the, the committee um, when you said even if they ended up living in Bro Brooklyn? Right, so our homeless children, if, they're, if they go to school in um, Glen Cove, which they have a choice, but do not live in Glen Cove. So in other words, they became homeless in Glen Cove, but uh, social services puts them in a shelter in you know, not, um, a different school district. And sometimes even in, in, this, in Brooklyn, you can go up until like 15 miles um, and they still are our children. We are obligated, number one, if they were going to school in person to transport them from wherever they're living to Glen Cove and back home. And in this case with COVID, they were uh, remote. So we had to make sure that they had devices and the opportunity to learn just like any other student in the district for all our homeless children. We have homeless ch children living all over the island. Um, they do not have to live in Glen Cove and be homeless, but if they became homeless while they did live in Glen Cove, then they are our responsibility, no matter where social services um, uh, gives them the um, place to live. And just to go one step further, if they are living in another school district and they decide because they do have a choice to attend that school district, that school district would have to bill the district in which they became homeless. And so we would get a bill if they originated their homeless situation while living in Glen Cove. Just like if we have children living here that are homeless from another district and a, a family took them on, a foster family took them on, um, then we would be billing that other district as well. So it goes both ways. Uh, I just wanted to clarify that. Thank you, Victoria. Okay, no problem. So on would we go again, this slide, not too much of a, a difference in the dollar change either way. Transportation, contract transportation. Again, uh, we have a uh, CPI increase with, the, with contract transportation all the time. It is by law that the company gets that CPI increase. Plus we also add, we also try to add in another bus or two or vans uh, anticipating maybe um, we may not be able to use um, all, our, all of the equipment that we have this year for next year. So we try to put in a couple more pieces of equipment in case it is needed. Uh, since it is, it is expensive. 
um, employee retirement is everyone in the districts who are not teachers that are in the employee retirement system. Teachers retirement system are for teachers, uh, central office, uh, teacher assistants, people like that. And again, there was a slight increase in the contribution rate for the district for each one of these retirement systems. But also that contributed to the increase was the uh, additional employees that we hired, whether they be teachers again, teacher assistants, monitors. Um, we, we hired some more custodial staff to help with the cleaning. We hired more nurses. Um, so they all, they all fall into one, one of these retirement systems. So naturally the contribution is gonna be higher. FICA is just the amount that we pay on salaries and that was slightly down. Unemployment, we weren't sure what was gonna happen with unemployment. We have an unemployment reserve so that the reserve will cover that $50,000 if we have to or need to or find that we're in a position that we don't need uh, all the staff that we have now moving forward, which is, is not looking that way right now, but at least we would have the unemployment to uh, cover them. Health insurance is up slightly, which was a nice surprise. It didn't really go through the roof, but you know we're anticipating probably a higher increase moving forward the next few years um, because of COVID and everything that had to get done. So the um, program component, which I said is the largest component in, in the budget was um, $78,733,219. So if we put all the components together, the um, budget that uh, we are uh, putting up for vote for the 2021-22 school year is $95,746,755. Uh, we are using, you know, if anyone's been, listens to me for the past eight presentation, years of presentations I've been uh, doing for the district, I always stress the importance of having reserves. And this is why, because in this, in the 2021-22 budget, we're using almost $3 million worth of our reserves. If we didn't have those reserves to fall back on, I mean, I would have to cut $3 million out of my budget somewhere. And I'm not sure where I would go because it, because of COVID so much is needed um, for instruction, it would really, really be a hard thing to do. So um, we're using this money from our reserves um, to, help, to help the budget. Um, this is um, the, the uh, budget postcard that I would assume or hope that most people did receive in the mail. And it just shows last year's adopted budget, um, which is the year we're in now and moving forward what next year's budget's gonna be according to um, the different uh, figures that had to be put on this, this postcard, which really doesn't tell you much as, as a taxpayer, because it doesn't show you your levy increase. This is just the budget to budget increase. This was the CPI, the consumer price index that we had to go by. Um, but what is important on this postcard is this contingency budget. The contingency budget would be a budget that the district would have to go to if um, the current budget that is put up for vote is, it fails. The district has a couple of options. They could put up the same budget again. They could put up a different budget or they can go straight on this contingency budget. But the problem with the contingency budget, and I'm just gonna to go to the next slide because when you get this postcard, it's all on one page for the presentation. I had to cut it in half. So this is just the bottom of that postcard and everything is again, broken down by those components. Um, but let's talk about the contingency budget. A contingency budget limits what the district can do with the, with the budget, with the money in the budget. It is um, a contingency budget contains only the legal expenses specified by the authority of, in order to maintain educational programs, preserve property and maintain the health and safety of the students and staff. The contingency budget will force the elimination of purchases of equipment and uh, it would stop the, the district from doing some of those capital projects that we would like to do. 
uh, contingency budget would eliminate the many of our co-curricular activities, sports programs, and field trips because they're not instructional in nature. The contingency budget would cause for the elimination of some of the course offerings at the high school. We would have to look at the enrollment of the courses and if, the, if there's not enough enrollment, we would, we would not be allowed to offer those courses. And a contingency budget will require the elimination of various positions across all labor units. We would have to look at each labor unit and figure out how and where and why we could cut uh, positions. Um, Dr. Rihanna, do you wanna do the state aid? Yes, thank you. So ladies and gentlemen, um, you may have heard me, I'm sure you have heard me, speak about state aid and specifically what's called foundation aid. For many, many, many years, uh, Glen Cove has not received their full allocation of foundation aid. When I was made aware of this several years back, I started to advocate not only locally uh, with our local politicians, but at the state level. And through our advocacy, um, we realized that there were a number of other districts that were having this situation. But Glen Cove was at a true disadvantage. Glen Cove up until this, this year was on or about only given 45% of the aid that is due them, okay? It's supposed to be 100%. There are some districts because of something called safe harmless that are at 110% or 118%. And we advocated very strongly, and if you heard me speak about the suburban harmed five, I advocated with uh, another superintendent from uh, Austin, New York, who was also dealing with the same issue. And we went up to the state ed department and spoke directly with the head of the education Senate committee, as well as the assembly's education committee, um, Assemblyman Benedetto, as well as Assemblyman, uh, Senator uh, Shelley Mayer. She understood because she comes from a district that also has that same issue, okay? Um, and so what we began to do is put a lot of pressure on the Senate, the governor's office, as well as the assembly. Together, I think we started to make headway. And I thought before COVID hit last late winter, we were very close at making a change that would have helped bring that 45% up to at least 50%, maybe more. Instead, what happened is that due to COVID, we spoke about and gave them a plan that would allow them to, um, well, would, uh, that suggested they could take some of that safe harmless money, the increases that are already going to very uh, wealthy districts and move some of that money towards providing equity in our districts that are not fully funded. As a result, the assembly and the Senate came up with what's called a one house budget. And in that budget, they suggested a formula. And I, I have to say it's very close to what we were uh, recommending as the Suburban Harm Five that indicated they would move any district that was not at 60% to at least 60%. And then any district at 60% or over would only get a minimum increase of 2%. As a result, for the 21-22 school year, we'll move at 60% which gave us a found, uh, an increase in foundation aid of $2.6 million. Now, this was great because during the pandemic, 
a, a, a situation that was unprecedented and honestly very sad for many, many families, many, many uh, situations across the country and worldwide. This was seemingly a bright spot. There was a true understanding that the lack of equity between districts had a lot to do with this foundation aid and the monies to be able to provide students with access to uh, equal education. And by that we mean providing Wi-Fi for families that did not have that option, devices, and instruction in a way that would uh, compare more favorably to the districts that were wealthy. And so this was a significant step in the right direction. Now, I am going to tell you that there's concern about paying future payments. And what do I mean by that? We are at 60% for 21-22 school year. Two factors here make con that concern us. One is that there's been a lot of um, monies needed to get through uh, the pandemic era. And as a result, New York State has increased their deficit. The governor can make a mid-year cut and can make full cuts to this 2.6 million. It's not guaranteed us. But, and in the past, if history repeats itself, foundation aid was promised years ago at full funding. That was in 2007. But then in 2010-11, something called the gap elimination adjustment came in. And what they did is they took this foundation aid that they started to give back to the districts that needed it, and they used it to, um, to decrease the state deficit. So we have to be very conservative and concerned in regard to this 2.6 million. It doesn't come to us uh, July 1st, it comes scattered through the school year in payments. And at any time, the governor could take back those payments. The other piece is that in the next two years, according to the, uh, the current budget that's moving forward for 21-22, we are supposed to get 50% of what else is owed to us. In other words, a 20% increase in the 22-23 school year and a second increase in the 23-24 school year that should bring us to full funding from now on. Again, the powers that be are saying, be very careful. There's concerns that are similar from the past and districts have been cautioned to use state aid in the following manner. The Board of Education should approve any reserves that have not yet previously been established. We are comfortable there. Replenish any reserves that have been previously depleted because in years to come, if in fact you get these cuts or you don't get the state aid that's promised you, you will need the reserves to preserve some of your programs. The third is that you should maintain your unassigned fund balance at the allowable 4% level because the following year that helps to alleviate some of the tax levy. So they're telling us plan as this is a one-time expenditure, a one-time allowable uh, increase for 21-22 because future state aid may re uh, remain at these levels for the future. It may help us a little better uh, because from 45, if it maintains at 60%, it's a little better, but they're saying there's a big question mark. They're wondering if this is just a tactic to keep people calm and may not be able to follow through with it. So how is Glen Cove going to use the increase in the 21-22 school year's foundation aid? We are going to work towards facilities upgrades. As um, was previously mentioned, we had a lot of work that needed to get done because of new restrictions and regulations as a result of safety and health regulations that came down from the state 
in regard to clean air, air circulation, and so on. You know that we had two failed bonds. As a result of that, we could not do some of the repairs in the HVAC systems that we really wanted to get done through that, those bonds. This allows us to be able to do those upgrades. That money that has been given to us, the increase in foundation aid, will allow us to do those upgrades without a direct cost to the community and then without a direct impact to the tax levy. There's also a problem with classroom space and regulation sized classrooms since the 70s, 1970s, has been 770 square feet. In Glen Cove, most of our classrooms are on or about 500 square feet. That was one of the reasons we could not return children back to five days a week of in-school instruction because of some of the problems we had with the six feet of, of social distancing and the, um, the classroom setups. We're hoping to be able to take care of that uh, in the coming year. So we also received something called federal, federal stimulus funding. Um, that covers a period of time of March 2020 of last year when we had to close down and that money is accountable to us until 2024. We got about two, about $3 million through the CARES Act and through the American Relief Plan Act, another 5 million. These funds cannot, uh, these funds are being used for addressing learning loss. So we'll have a summer program. We'll intervene in regard to responses to students' academic, social, and emotional needs. We'll be providing mental health services and support, which we all know has been a major problem, a major situation even before the pandemic and only further exacerbated uh, through the pandemic. And we will have to continue to provide meals, breakfast and lunch, and provide on, ongoing uh, online learning to all students that are going to qualify for that. You can also use them for purchasing supplies to sanitize and clean educational facilities. You know that there has been an increase in that protocol and we have followed that protocol to the nth degree. We're, pro we're purchasing uh, educational technology, including software, hardware, and connectivity so that when there are changes to the uh, COVID numbers and we are forced to close down, we will continue the instruction as per the state ed department regulations through remote learning. School facility repairs and improvements to, be in, to enable operations of schools to reduce the risk of COVID or any virus transmission and attend and support to the student health needs and to develop policies in line with this, the CDC requirements for the reopening and operation of school facilities. And again, with a focus on health and safety of our students, our educators, our staff. What federal stimulus money cannot be used for is tax relief. That is right in the regulation. But I will tell you that we have already been told, I'm sorry, I'm getting an emergency phone call from the Department of Health. Victoria, could you just take over for one moment? I'll be sure. right back. No problem. So in the budget that was passed by the governor, <clears throat> there's also what is called a property tax relief credit. Um, this program, uh, there are eligibility requirements. So the property must be the residence of the owner. The owner must pay more than 6% of their gross income on property taxes. The property owners earning less than $75,000 will see that full benefit of the credit and it is phased out entirely for those earning more than $250,000 annually. Right now, how the taxpayer applies for it or receives it is not known 
at this time. But once we get more information on this program, we will let the community know. As you know, in the past, um, not the past year or two, but before that for about four years, if you did qualify for the uh, tax credit, uh, you received a check in the amount of the increase in your taxes from the Department of Finance. A lot of people were receiving checks and they really weren't even aware why they were receiving these checks. That was because the, um, the school district was enrolled in these programs for the residents and the school district stayed at or below the tax cap. And actually when we did that, all the residents that qualified for those programs were eligible to receive those checks. So this is now another um, tax relief credit uh, program in the new in the new budget. So just just as an uh, an FYI, I you know many remember in uh, 2019 around May of 2019, Moody's um, got in touch with me um, to do uh, an interview and give them certain information about the district because they had seen. Just so you know, we give Moody's. Um, which does the credit rating for uh, many companies and districts, uh, we give them our financials every year. So they had seen that the district's financials were looking better, the reserves were picking up and things like that. And we went through the whole process and they did raise the, the district's credit rating from an AA3 to an AA2 rating. Um, just so you know, there's one, there's two more step, there's one more step and then you're at the highest rating. Um, so, but just so you know that a district's pass fail percentage of their budgets is one of the components that Moody's looks at when assigning a credit rating. Um, that's one of the um, things they, they look at. They look at the community as a whole. They didn't just look at Glen Cove School District. They looked at the city of Glen Cove as a whole also. And it, they wanna see that the community um, has faith in their schools and passes their budgets. Um, that's a good indication for them as far as uh, the rating goes. And if you want to see any uh, other information about the district's rating, uh, you can go to www.moody's.com and it's there. It's public information. The budget vote for the 2021-22 school year by the qualified voters of the Glen Cove City School District will be held on Tuesday, May 18th, 2021 between the hours of 6 a.m. and 9 p.m. There are two voting locations, Glen Cove High School for election districts A, B, and C, and Connolly School for election district D. If you do not know or are not sure, if you're new to the district uh, where you vote, you can give a call um, to our uh, district clerk, Ida Johnson here at the um, at Thayer House at the Admin Center, and we will look up exactly where you go to vote. So at this point, I just want to say, just please remember to vote. And if anyone has any questions, concerns, that's my email address. Uh, all these presentations, the line by line budget, because what you saw in the presentation was a total of multiple lines. Some people like to look at the line by line budget. That's posted on our website also with this presentation and with all the presentations starting from January when we started the budget process. I want to thank you for your time and for inviting us to do this. Um, and hopefully next time we do it, we can do it in person. Thank you, Victoria. Does anyone have any questions at this time? No one? All good? Okay. Well, thank you very much. If you do think of anything, again, you can reach out to me. My, my contact is on the website, Dr. Rihanna also, or Dr. Israel. Thank you so much, and everyone have a great day. Thank you, Victoria. Take care. Bye. All right. Uh, Gabor, do you want to go into a little bit? Where'd you go? I'm here. Oh, there you are. You're in, you switched corners on me. Um, do you want to go a little bit into I our... I think you found me. It's like, where's Waldo? <laughs> yes, uh, thank you. Uh, um, a few things uh, we have to talk about. Um, 
first and foremost, uh, our upcoming 50th anniversary gala celebration. We are 50 years old and we don't look a day older. Um, we have a great thing going. And uh, let me uh, show you a few things here regarding the gala. First of all, we have a fantastic gala committee and it's not too late for you to join us. It's Bonnie Nogan, uh, Jermaine Crowder, um, Colleen Spinello, Carolyn Wilson, and Sharon Harris uh, and myself. Um, if you are interested in helping us make it a fantastic evening, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out to me and join us. This is just a um, draft of uh, an invitation that we are working on with uh, Jamee. Um, as you can see, it is going to be on October 2nd uh, at the Metropolitan, 6 to 10 p.m. We are really hoping that we can do this in person safely. Uh, by then, we're going to be honoring our founder, Rhoda Finer, and our past presidents. Um, we are going to have a 50-50 with a cash prize. Uh, Spiro is uh, reaching out to uh, Ballroom Legacy to sh uh, give us a dancing show. and also They will do it. I spoke to them. Oh, beautiful. And uh, show us some moves. Um, it's going to be 6 to 10 p.m. The death draft program is right on your screen. Uh, it's nothing fancy. We want to make it fun and easy with as little and sh as short speeches as we can, but still um, give enough time to our past presidents and our honorees to, to talk. Also, uh, every single one of our agencies are welcome to give us a two minutes um, um, celebratory speech if you wish. Um, Ticket prices are varied and we uh, combine them. We're gonna have a uh, commemorative journal, which will double as a um, member directory. All of our member agencies will be in there. So it's not just a uh, keepsake for the uh, 50th anniversary, but also a usable reference. Um, I encourage all of us to uh, purchase at least a um, business card listing. It's only 150 bucks, but if you wanna go to a quarter page, half page, full page, inside cover or back cover, those are the prices up there. We need your ad by September 1st. I'm going to reach out to um, Stevenson Printing here in Glen Cove to keep it in house. And um, they are very good at uh, printing um, journals. Um, uh, Jamee and I worked on um, putting everything on our website and as of an hour ago or maybe just uh, half an hour ago, the uh, link is up on our website right here. And if you click on this, uh, it's gonna open. Um, it's gonna open, I said, hello. It should, here we go. It opens this page. Um, which is basically the invitation. And uh, Jermaine just made this beautiful thing down here. Here are all the uh, levels that you can participate in. Just an individual ticket is a hundred bucks. A table of eight is uh, 700. If your company wants to buy a, pur a purchase and table. And then here we go with the business card listings and the full uh, half page and so on. So what you can do is click on, okay, I wanna buy a table. Uh, and then get tickets down here and it takes you to your uh, PayPal account and uh, you will be able to um, purchase right there. And you just go to, to check out. Um, so that's, that's up and running right now. Um, I think the PayPal button is still not 100%, but hopefully by the day, days and it's gonna work. Uh, correctly. Um, so that's the gala. If you have any questions, let me know. If you want to join us uh, in the gala committee, we can use you. Um, uh, Bonnie and Sharon was so nice to uh, take on the, the journal, um, the creation of the journal, but we need your cooperation by purchasing your ticket and, and submitting your journal ad or business card. So that's about the 50th anniversary. 
Uh, can I go on the ad and to the membership list or do you want to take yes. it? No, 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 go. Okay. Um, as you probably know, uh, we are running a quarter page ad in the uh, Herald every month and we are going to do it all the way through the year. Uh, they gave us a very good uh, deal. Uh, this is the May ad that I ju just submitted to them since it was approved by the executive board. Uh, on the top, we talk about ourselves and in the middle, we have a different message every month. Uh, then there is a save a date for the gala and on the bottom, we have different agencies that uh, are featured every month. It's four per month all the way through the year. So this is this month's um, your agency will come on, uh, especially if you're a paid agency. We are trying to stick to agencies that paid. Um, but uh, almost that brings me to the next topic. Um, our, um, our member, our paid members are up to 33. Uh, I just missed a check from the Hershey Foundation. So that's gonna be 34. Uh, I emailed out this list to every one of you. Uh, if you see any changes in your mem in your um, emails or contact info, please email back to me and I will, I will correct it on this list. Uh, you can see if you paid for 21 or not. And if you haven't, please, please, please uh, send in your check. You can also pay for two years like uh, all these people did here. And then I don't bother you next year. Um, there is one new column here, it says feature. That means that uh, we already featured these members in the uh, ads, the monthly ads. That's, that's what the feature means. So uh, we have currently uh, uh, $7,995.66 on our account. Uh, our accountant is paid uh, for the tax returns and the um, ads are paid, so we are in good shape. Uh, our gala, by the way, is not a fundraiser per se. We're gonna end up with some money and then we, we will, would like to uh, have some ideas from all of you regarding, um, do you see what I see? Do you see the- um... No, we see you. Okay, so why don't you say so? I'm so sorry. Um, Okay, hold on. Uh, ended the meeting.